This time I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to grab a pew Bible from in front of you to follow along with our scripture reading, it'll also be on the cover of your bulletin and on the screen behind me. If you're at home, I hope you have a Bible at hand that you can flip open to as well. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, sorry, John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. Hear the word of the Lord. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel! And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he'd done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Well, this morning we're continuing our uh, Lenten sermon series called Twisted. You know, it just doesn't take much to realize as we look around us in our world today that something isn't right. From the absurdly short tempers on the commute to and from work to the coworker who manipulates and lies and yet still gets the promotion to the spate of school shootings that just seem to happen year after year after year. The evidence leads to one simple conclusion. We as a people are broken. We're twisted on the inside. And this twistedness affects everything about who we are and what we do. It affects our love, our relationships. It affects our understanding of truth and even our hope. The question is, what can be done about it? Well, of course, as we've seen, there really isn't anything we can do about it. But God can, and God did. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to fix the twistedness that resides in each one of us. Now, most of those who met and walked with Jesus while he was on earth didn't realize what he was or why he'd come. But there is one scene in his life where Jesus makes it explicitly clear. And that scene is the triumphant entry into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday so long ago. As we look at the timeless truth of this true tale, we will see that in order to save a twisted world, who better than a king with a twist? Would you pray with me? Lord God, from the very first moment you entered creation, you have defied expectation. You have exceeded expectation. You have surprised us so much that we have often wondered what the heck is going on. And we have been left in awe of the beauty of who you are, what you've been willing to do for us, and what you continue to do on our behalf. Lord, this morning as we come to your word and look again at this story that's been told for 2,000 years, would you subvert our expectations once again. Would you surprise us by your Holy Spirit that we may see your Son more fully, more truly, more deeply. It is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. Well, one of the struggles that we have in understanding and relating to the Bible is that the world that we live in now is so very different from the world of biblical times. Uh, a pastor friend of mine once said that it would be easier for a Martian to come to earth and understand us and our culture than it is for us to go back 2,000 years and understand the culture of the first century world. For example, we talked a little bit ago about this weird palm branch waving thing that they did, 
right? I mean, that's just weird. That's so outside anything that we do nowadays, right? So I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I also think there's a lot of ways and a lot of aspects in which our, uh, our, we're actually very similar to the people back then. And one of those aspects is that just like first century Jews, we live in a broken world that is yearning for a savior. Now, back then, the Jews were looking for a political savior who would free Israel from being trapped underneath the thumb of the Roman Empire and restore Israel to the glory that she'd once experienced under Kings David and Solomon. For over 500 years, they had waited and they would continue to wait. In most practical respects, though, they had pretty much given up that the Lord's Messiah was ever going to come. Today, we are also yearning for a Savior, but what we desire to be saved from these days, I think, is much more complex. When we're honest, we'd be willing to admit that what we're really looking for is someone who will save us from ourselves. We see this reflected in the dreams of little girls who yearn for their white knight to come and sweep them off their feet and carry them away to their happily ever after. We see it in the dreams of little boys who connect with stories like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, or all of the countless superhero movies that show ordinary people becoming extraordinary and doing amazing things. Deep down inside, in the very core of who we are in our being, we are all yearning for a king to come and take this broken, twisted world and finally make it right. And on on that first Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago, that is exactly the statement that Jesus Christ made. While he spent most of his earthly ministry dodging the question of whether he was Israel's Messiah, the king for whom they'd been waiting, when he left Bethany that morning to head for Jerusalem, he cast all doubts aside and he did it without saying a single word. Now there are three significant pieces to the story that make it clear that Jesus was proclaiming himself to be their king. The first piece is the great crowd that comes out to meet Jesus, uh, comes out from Jerusalem to meet Jesus. Now you see, this season was the time of the Passover celebration. And so people from all over Israel and Galilee had come to Jerusalem. Word reaches them that Jesus was on his way. And so the crowd, eager and excited, rushes out of the city to meet him. Now, by this point in time, most everyone had either seen Jesus for themselves or heard of him from someone who did. So the opportunity to see and hear him was one that you're just not going to pass this up. We got to go. Jesus is coming. Are you great? Yes, we're going. Not only that, but John tells us that word of Jesus as having raised Lazarus from the dead had spread far and wide as well. So everybody is talking about this miracle and the man who did it, and they want to come see for themselves. The second significant piece is, as we've talked about, the palm branches that were waved. As Again, this is a weird thing for us today. The crowd took palm branches and they placed them on the road before Jesus and they waved them in the air. Again, this is one of those first century cultural things that we still do today on this morning in honor of this event, but we don't really know why or remember why. Well, back then, palm branches were waved as a sign of victory and triumph, as a sign of celebration. It was an honor that was primarily reserved for a king. You don't wave palm branches for just anybody. If you're waving a palm branch, You think the person coming is the king. And that's what the crowd was saying. The third piece is the accolades that the crowd shouted. Hosanna means save. It's an exclamation of praise. So the Jews clearly saw 
Jesus as a Messiah type. And so they call out blessings on him as such. They'd heard of his raising Lazarus. If he can do that, if he can raise somebody from the dead, then freeing us from the Romans, that's going to be a cakewalk. This is going to be so cool. Right? And so they sing their praises. They pro proclaim him not only Messiah, but also king. The question, though, is whether they saw him as a political savior or actually God's Messiah. Now, John obviously plants seeds that Jesus was a lot more than the crowd realized. And this begins to set up a conflict for the crowd that would play such an important role in their sudden switch from pro proclaiming Jesus as king to wanting him crucified by the end of the week. You see, the crowd had a very particular set of expectations for their Messiah King. Expect, expectations about what he would do, how he would do it, and when he would accomplish it. See, they had a set of earthly expectations for God's Messiah. And they didn't take the time to see if their earthly expectations were in line with God's eternal expectations. Because of that, they missed a very obvious sign that all was not as they thought it would be. You see, Jesus came into Jerusalem and proclaimed himself king, but not just any king. He proclaimed himself a king with a twist. This conquering, victorious king came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. This act was so far outside the expectations of the people, even of the disciples, that most of them just glossed over it. They just ignored it. They said, I, I cannot process that. And so we're going to set that aside. We're going to forget it. It was something you couldn't not see. He's riding on a donkey. How do you miss that? But respond to with something along the lines of a, well, that's different. But if it works for Jesus, okay, whatever. He's just a little strange. But this was, wasn't something to gloss over. This act of Jesus was of crucial and essential importance. And if they'd just been paying closer attention, it would have radically changed all of their expectations for this Messiah King. You see, when conquering kings or those returning from the field of victory come back, they did so on giant, beautiful, powerful, majestic war horses, stallions, an animal that represents their power, their might, their strength. But a, but a donkey? There's very little beautiful, powerful, or majestic about a donkey. Back then... Donkeys were symbols of peace and of humility. And riding into Jerusalem on this donkey fulfilled a prophecy from Zechariah 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. And in the verses around that one in Zechariah, there is a strong contrast that is drawn between the conqueror on a war horse versus the Lord's prince of peace. This is a king who is the subversive prince of peace, who defies and undercuts our expectations. And John doesn't want us to miss this point like the crowd did back then. Jesus undercut their expectations so radically that the disciples, they didn't even realize what was actually going on. John tells us in verse 16 that at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. It was so much later when they looked back that, that all of a sudden, it made sense. What do they say about hindsight? Hindsight's always 2020, right? And finally, they got it. 
The disciples' constant struggle throughout Jesus' ministry was their futile efforts to reconcile their earthly expectations of Jesus with God's eternal plan. After Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, all of the pieces suddenly clicked together for them. And they realized that God's plan was so much bigger than their earthly expectations and hopes and dreams. Of course, as we just said, hindsight is always 2020, so they say. And at that time of their first Palm Sunday and Holy Week, nobody got what was actually going on. We all know how quickly the tide of public opinion can change. Sunday's king becomes Friday's whipping boy. When the crowd realized that Jesus wasn't the Messiah King that they thought he was, they went from shouts of celebration to shouts of crucifixion. When God's plan didn't match their expectations, they decided that God had let them down once again. It's interesting, don't you think? How our twisted natures can take our misplaced expectations and turn them into a foundation of self-righteous indignation. The crowds were looking for Jesus to enter their lives and turn their world upside down, which is exactly what he did. But he did it in a way that none of them expected or wanted. So they killed him for it. What about you? Where and how are you looking for Jesus to enter your life? One of the ongoing aspects of our walk with Christ, no matter how long you've been a Christian, is that we are always looking for signs of Christ's presence in our lives. Most often we're looking for assurance that he actually is present in our lives. Sometimes we're looking for a fresh insight, a new direction a tangible sense of hope that all will not always be as it is now. We are looking for a Messiah King, and we all have expectations for how Jesus is going to appear in our lives. But if there's one thing that I've learned, if there's one thing that today's passage makes abundantly clear, it's that Jesus never appears the way we expect. There's always going to be a twist. Just as Jesus entered into, into Jerusalem in a way that no one expected, so he will also enter our lives in ways we don't expect. But far too often, when our earthly expectations go unmet, just like the crowd in Jerusalem, we start blaming Jesus instead of looking to see what he's really doing in us and in our lives. The thing is, wasn't Jesus' entire life in ministry one of defying expectations? Born in a cave to a teenage girl, never having a home, befriending tax collectors and sinners, defying family norms, loving the unloved, so many countless other examples. It makes me wonder why we are always so surprised when Jesus does the same thing with us. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to trust someone who can be counted on to do what you don't expect. And Jesus calls us above and beyond all else to place our trust, our faith in him. And if we're going to do that, then there has to be something we can trust and count on Jesus to do. There has to be something that we can expect him to do that he will actually do. And there is. In fact, there are two expectations we can have of Jesus that he will always meet. The first is that we can always expect Jesus to always love us so much that he will meet us in the midst of our twistedness. Jesus came into a twisted world in order to save it. He came to it in the midst of its brokenness, its sinfulness, its messiness, its twistedness, in order to heal it. And he will do the same thing with us. As we saw last time, Paul said to the Romans, but God demonstrates his love for his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Jesus doesn't come to us after we've cleaned ourselves up, after we've fixed all of our mistakes, after we've made everything right. He comes to us first so that we can then be more like him. If you're a human being, no matter how long you've been a Christian, then there are areas of sin, of twistedness, of brokenness still present in your life, in your heart, and in your soul. You can expect Jesus to continue to love you so much that he will meet you in the midst of that brokenness. There is nothing, nothing that you have done or will do that will keep him from loving you and meeting you in that place. But that's not all you can expect. You can also expect that Jesus will always love us too much to leave us in our twistedness. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus didn't come just to love us in the midst of our twistedness. He came to lift us out of that mess and change us from the inside out so that we don't have to be twisted or broken anymore. Jesus promised us more and better life than you've ever dreamed of. But we can't experience that more and better life if we're still mired in our sin, in our brokenness. Jesus died so that we might become a new creation. One remade, renewed, reformed from the inside out. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to bring about that work, to make that work happen. You weren't meant to be stuck in the mud. You were meant to celebrate and to dance with the king. Brothers and sisters, 2,000 years ago, Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem proclaiming himself king, but a king with a twist. Today, Jesus still presents himself that same way. May God bless each one of us this holy week as we seek to let go of our earthly expectations and allow Jesus to be the king of our lives that God had always intended him to be. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for your patience with us. We praise you for the wonderful ways you have defied our expectations and exceeded them, shattering them. We confess how often we miss what you're doing. And we confess the disappointment and the anger that we feel when you don't do what we want you to do. Lord, this week, fill us with wonder and awe. Surprise us anew. Move in a powerful and mighty way through your Holy Spirit in each of our hearts, through us as a congregation, and in this community. Show us once again, Lord, that you are our King. But not a King who comes to conquer, a King who comes to serve, to die, to love, to transform, to renew. Renew us again, Lord. Fill us with your grace. Surprise us with your wonder. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.